Follow along in a compelling drama as two strangers, wise, articulate, passionate, mature followers of Christ, become pen pals, then friends and confidants. Listen to their voices. Watch hope rise as they make plans to finally meet face to face. Their story is rich in insight. It is deeply human and profoundly moving. Hearing their own story in their own words has changed my life. I hope it will touch yours. This is Pints with Jack, Season 7, Episode 10, The Major and the Missionary. After Hours with Dr. Diana pavlak glyer and Dr. Don W. King. Welcome to Pints with Jack, the podcast where we read through the works of C.S. Lewis. Today is an After Hours episode. And today's opening quotation is an extract from Dr. Diana pavlak glyers latest book, The Major and the Missionary. And this book is the complete correspondence between C.S. Lewis's brother and a lady named Blanche Biggs. So, if you want to know how Major Warren Lewis ended up corresponding with a missionary in Papua New Guinea, how their correspondence shaped each other, and whether or not he thought she was cute, please stay tuned. And I'm joined today by the editor of the letters, Dr. Diana pavlak Glyer. Dr. Glyer has been on Pipes of Jack many times, most recently for our C.S. Lewis Reading Day episode. She is an award-winning writer who has spent more than 40 years combing through archives and studying old manuscripts and has read every single word of every single inkling. Her scholarship, her teaching, and her work as an artist all circle back to one common theme. Creativity thrives in community. Dr. Glyer, welcome to Parts with Jack. Oh, thank you so much for that warm introduction. I'm so glad to be here. It's always a pleasure to talk with you. Mm, and I have personally been growing in holiness the last couple of years by allowing my co-hosts to conduct the interviews with you, but I decided enough (laughs) is enough. I'm holy enough, at least for the time being. So brief pause on sanctification and I get to do this interview. (laughs) I'm so glad. Uh, But I'm also joined today by another guest. Joining our discussion is another regular guest on the show and Warren Lewis expert, Dr. Don W. King. He has taught at Montreat College for 47 years, teaching courses in British literature with a focus on Shakespeare, Chaucer, Milton, Romantic literature, Victorian literature, and 20th century British literature. He's been on the show before to talk about Jack's poetry, Joy's poetry, and most recently to discuss his own book on Warren Lewis, Soldier, Writer, Inkling, A Life of Warren Hamilton Lewis. Dr. King, welcome to Pints for Jack. Oh, it's great to be back. Always enjoy the conversation and listening to the podcasts afterwards. Thank you. So thanks. <laughs> Merry Christmas to everybody too. Merry Christmas. And I've got to say, this is a very well-timed book. Uh, last month, we finished reading C.S. Lewis's Letters to an American Lady. And this book, The Major and the Missionary, is a collection of correspondence, which was itself initiated in response to another collection of letters. So this is all getting very recursive. And not only (laughs) that, we have the Warren Lewis dream team together to discuss it. Well, it's always a pleasure for me to be teamed with my colleague and friend, uh, Don King. So that uh, is a joy in itself. But I love this recursive aspect of the Major and the Missionary being a collection of letters that was in response to Blanche's reading of a collection of letters that was edited by Warren Hamilton Lewis. And so we're very uh, letter-centric these days, and I just think that that's a delight. It's so good to hear uh, the words of these uh, in interesting and thoughtful Christians in their own words. Mm. Well, today I'm enjoying a nice cup of tea. Are you two drinking anything, Dr. Glyer? Yeah, I am also drinking tea. I'm drinking my favorite. Uh, you may be familiar with it. It's PG Tips Extra Ooh. Strong. Oh, yes. I... This is how you produce so much stuff. PG Tips. It all now <laughs> becomes clear. <laughs> this is the secret. Yes, it is uh, It is a good, strong cup of tea. <laughs> how about you, Dr. King? Yeah, I'm having uh, some green tea, Bigelow green tea, sort of uh, wimpy tea, I guess, but it's good. <laughs> Not wimpy, refined. And uh, it's green tea. It's very appropriate given Warney's uh, penchant and love for the East. Well, cheers. 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 So let's kick this off with a little bit of background. Um, Dr. King, for those who are fairly new to the world of Lewis, or at least his wider circle, would you mind please sharing some details about Warren Lewis's background and backstory? Sure. Uh, Warren was born in 1895, three years before Jack. 
Um, they had, a, I think, a really good childhood up until the time of their mother's death. Uh, then both boys were um, eventually sent off to boarding school in England. Warney, of course, went first, um, had a pretty dreadful experience at Winyard. Jack joined him for a couple of years. That didn't last very long. Eventually, the headmaster was certified as insane. And then Warney went on to Malvern College. He absolutely adored Malvern College. Um, I think there were so many pluses when he compared his existence to Winyard that um, he just embraced his time there fully. He made friends. He enjoyed the facilities, again, quite contrary to the way it had been at Winyard. Um, he became um, something of a hail fellow well met, I think. But again, just really enjoyed his, his time there. Jack came after Warren had left uh, Malvern, and Jack's experience was just the opposite. He basically hated um, his existence there at Malvern College for, for a number of reasons. But anyway, eventually, uh, Warney decided that he wanted to have a career in the Army. He saw um, 1913, 1914, he saw World War One coming, and so um, he talked his father into getting him tutored to take the entrance exam to Sandhurst, and he was tutored by W.T. Kirkpatrick, the same person who would later on uh, tutor Jack. And I think that um, both boys, uh, maybe maybe we know Jack saying this more than Warney, but both boys uh, owe a whole lot to Kirkpatrick, I think in one of Warney's journal journal writings, he says something like, I owe more to him than any other person I know. Mm-hmm. So Kirkpatrick prepared him well for the entry exam to Sandhurst. He was successful. He was even um, so successful he graduated towards the top of the class and got a scholarship. Then he goes off to war, World War I. He was in northern France most of uh, most of the war. Um, saw, as many soldiers did, many, many horrific kinds of things. But his biggest concern what on the Western Front, his biggest concern was Jack and when Jack was going to come. He worried about um, his brother all the way through the war. And so um, the kind of a funny story in one sense, when Jack is wounded, he gets a telegram, uh, Warren, he gets a telegram about that. So Warney jumps on a motorcycle and rides 50 miles to find Jack, expecting that he was badly wounded. And when he walks into the tent, Jack starts cracking jokes. <laughs> so um, it wasn't quite as bad as Warney thought. Uh, certainly Jack was injured, and he, some of those injuries he carried with him all the way through the war. But uh, Warney, um, after World War One, continued his career um, in the Royal British Army Corps, he was, uh, which was basically a, a support arm of the British Army. He went to Sierra Leone for a year, had various postings in England, and then in the late 1920s, he went to um, the Far East. He went to Shanghai, and he spent uh, about three, three and a half years there. He comes back, and th- those those years, I think, were, uh, they're very interesting, but I think he had long periods of boredom, and um, it was during that time in particular that he probably began to um, use alcohol in, in, in excess. Um, he enjoyed, enjoyed um, reading. Um, he was a voracious reader like his brother. I think his, his diary for 1926, I think all he did was list the books that he read each month. Um, And it was, uh, you know, quite a number uh, of books. His tastes were pretty eclectic. He liked reading history. He he had become fascinated with um, French history during World War I, towards the end of that time period. But he read Dostoevsky. He read Conrad. um, Again, you know, fairly eclectic kind of taste. Jack talked him into reading Paradise Lost and Comus. And uh, Warney actually was surprised that he sort of liked those works. At one point, he intended to read through the Bible, but when he got to Leviticus, he just said, I can't. I can't do it. (laughs) So he comes back, um, eventually retiring in 1932 from the Army. He comes back, beginning what he said was the business of life. 
And he, the, one of the first things he did was begin organizing the Lewis papers. These were all the family papers from 1850 up until 1930. And so he was the main editor, although he um, did work with Jack, and they talked about what was going on. In the end, he produces an 11-volume set of Lewis papers that have become gold mines for biographers and others interested in the, the Lewis family. All of that without aid of um, a computer, just a, a typewriter that he used the hunt, hunt, and mech, hunt and peck method, just one finger at a time. And that, that typewriter is sort of, uh, I think it's the only, or, only original artifact that's in the kilns now. Is that right, Diana? That is correct. That's right. Yeah. Um, he also um, had a motorboat built so that he could cruise around the canals in, in Oxford partially as a way of getting away from the kilns and, in particular, Mrs. Moore, um, <laughs> a, a relationship fraught with all kinds of, I'm not quite sure what the right word is. I'll just say difficulties. No need to go into that right now. Um, he begins um, writing French history towards the end of the 1930s. Um, he's active as an inkling at the beginning uh, in 1942 when he comes back from a very short stint in World War II. Uh, we owe a warning much of what we know about some of the Inklings meetings because he wrote about them in his journal, his diary. Um, quite wonderful reading. You should, uh, I would encourage your listeners to read his published diary, Brothers and Friends. Um, just just fil filled with wonderful insights about warning. Brothers and Friends is only about 10% of a complete diary. So there's a lot more Yikes. that you would have to... Um, <laughs> No other, you'd have to go to the Wade Center to read read the rest of it. But nonetheless, really, really good stuff. Then he ends up through the 1950s, uh, writing six, uh, writing seven 1950s through the uh, about 1963. He writes in in the end seven books on 17th century French history. All this time, he is again living with Jack and Mrs. Moore at the kilns. Again, the relationship is fraught. But he is, uh, he's a faithful member of Holy Trinity Church there in Headington. At one point, I think he served on the vestry. Um, so he was active, if you will, probably more active than Jack in the work of a local church congregation, the parish church. After Jack dies, it was devastating for Warney. Um, and I don't want to go into great detail there because it's, I just want to lead into what Diana is going to talk about. So Jack dies in 63. Warren lives on to 1973. Um, I think the last 10 years can be characterized uh, with regard to Warney's life as um, dark, not necessarily depressing. He um, never got over the loss of Jack, and he would write about that regularly. He had several dreams when um, Jack appears in the dream and Warney runs to try to embrace him, and of course, it's just a, a wraith. There's nothing there. I would say that Blanche Biggs was one of about three or four persons that Warney, that Warney developed a very deep relationship with in the last 10 years of, of, of his life. I would include other people like um, Clive Kilby, and perhaps by default, David and Douglas Gresham. Again, I think that the correspondence that Diana has put together and edited is a wonderful testimony to the kind of relationship that Warney could have with a person when the person was interested in him and not in his more famous brother. <laughs> it really irritated him when Walter would bring people to the kiln, Walter Hooper would bring people to the kiln sort of casually. And uh, maybe Warney was being um, peevish, I'm not sure, but it, it irritated him. So when people like Blanche and uh, like Clive Kilby appreciated Warren for Warren, um, good relationships usually follow. He dies in 1973 at the Kilns after having been back in his beloved Ireland. And I think that kind of brings us up to where Diana can take over. Yeah, that's great. You know, Don, I'm really excited that you you focus on this idea of the uh, where the focus is when people stop by the kilns or when they write letters to the kilns during the period after Jack Jack's death. And I just sometimes try to imagine 
him sitting there, Warren sitting there week after week, after week after week, year after year, literally, after having served as Jack's secretary during Jack's life, now after Jack's death, the letters keep coming one yeah. after another. And what would it have been for him to go out, pick up another packet of letters, come back to the house, start sifting through them, and to find a letter that was addressed to him and not to his brother, and that's asking questions about his work and not his brother's work. And that, I think, is part of what is startling to Warren Lewis and what is delightful for us as we see this correspondence between Warren Lewis and Blanche Biggs. Mm -hmm. I, I agree. I think that that's probably the most extended correspondence that he has with anyone, certainly after Jack's death. Well, Dr. Glyer, C.S. Lewis begins screw tape by saying that he's definitely not going to tell us how this correspondence fell into his hands. But can you tell us a little bit about the story of how you came across this correspondence between Warney and Blanche? Sure, I can. I will tell that story uh, because it happened very providentially for me. So I was working at the Wade Center, that magical, magical place. I was working at the Wade Center looking for firsthand accounts of meetings of the Inklings. And as Don said, most of the great firsthand information we have about what happened in an Inklings meeting we have because Warren made note of it in his diaries or wrote letters about what was happening in meetings. He was a historian by inclination, not just by his uh, achievement. So he would take these wonderfully perceptive notes about various conversations, who was present, what was talked about, that sort of thing. So I was working on my book, The Company They Keep, that tries to give that inside fly in the wall perspective of the meetings of the Inklings which meant I need to, needed to sift through everything that Warren had written looking for these references. And as I was in that process, I was literally going through a box of materials and I came across this letter that I assumed had been misfiled somehow because it was so different from everything I'd been reading. Letters by Warren Lewis, scraps and notes by Warren Lewis. And all of a sudden there was a letter in the box written by a missionary doctor, Blanche Biggs. It was to Warren Lewis, and it was an appreciation for his editing job that he did on the letters of C.S. Lewis. And I thought, this is really kind of cool. Warren got a fan letter and uh, <laughs> someone encouraging him, someone who appreciated what he had done. But the other thing that Blanche did that was so, I think, instrumental in what followed is she asked a question. And the question she was asking in that very, very first letter was, what's the value of letters? What's the, uh, the, what's, the, what's the purpose of collecting our papers, our journals, and passing these on to future generations? Do these things matter? And in her letter, I heard sort of a, is anybody there? Does anybody notice the work that's going on behind the scenes. Is anybody aware of it? And he was very generous to respond to that. So the first letter there, a letter from her, and then lo and behold, a response uh, from Warren Lewis to her, generous in its approach, warm and encouraging in telling her that he was interested in what she had to say, that he thought she had what it would take to be a writer and that she should keep those letters, that she should do something with them in the future. So this letter collection is in the Wade Center. And uh, I, I don't, it's really not true to say that I discovered it, but perhaps I just noticed how unique the sequence of letters was, the, that we have both sides of the story. We have uh, mm -hmm. her letters, we have Warren's letters, we have the entire set of correspondence. And David, you're, you know how it is when we're reading letter collections. You've just been working on letters to an American lady. And as you're going through that, you can't help but think, what in the world were her letters like? Yeah. What did she say? What is she asking? More specifically, in order to be accurate in assessing that collection of letters, you're asking the question, what is Jack responding to or reacting to when he's writing in this particular way or giving this particular answer? And so imagine my delight in discovering the sequence of letters between Warney and Blanche, where we have literally all of the letters that pass between them. 
Diana, wouldn't you like to discover the letters that Arthur Greaves wrote to C.S. Lewis? Oh, my goodness. <laughs> wouldn't that be something? Yeah. That- what insights that would give us to have those letters. And again, we tend to read a letter collection as if it is sort of a neutral bottom line on the issues being discussed, but it's a conversation. And so it's always bouncing off what questions were asked or what observations were made in the previous part of that conversation. And so this is unique. It's unique in, in um, literary letters in general that we have both sides in, in completely of the correspondence. Yeah, and every Christian is used to actually doing this one-sided letter reading when we read the New Testament, because we have the letters of Paul, John, Peter, and we don't have the ones on the other side. So we have to do a bunch of work to try and work out the context in which they're writing. But it is very special that we have both sides in this correspondence. And also just the fact that there is a story here. This was the thing that that really struck me because I read this collection, literally, it was the next thing I read after Letters to an American Lady, and the difference that here you have a back and forth and you see character arcs. There is a story being told with a beginning, middle, and end. Yeah, I love that aspect of it. It has a strong narrative quality, uh, so much so that I've now gotten four letters of complaint from readers. (laughs) And the letters complain that the story is so compelling that they've stayed up past their bedtime, turning pages to find out what's going to happen next. It does have that kind of edge of your seat uh, development of character and character arc and story arc, stories and incidents that carry through across letters, uh, a whole series of letters. And it's it's right there in the correspondence. Mm Mm-hmm. And compared to Letters from an American Lady, that now seems a little, I want to put a word, scrappy, because there's, mm. it, they're, they're darting around lots of different ideas as well. Whereas here, there are, there are a few topics that they spend time talking about and exploring something that the other person had said, and the explanations go across multiple letters. Exactly right. This does beg the question, how is it that we have both sides in this case? Because C.S. Lewis was well known for burning letters that were sent to him. Uh, and there's stories from Walter Hooper about a particular bonfire where Warney was getting rid of lots of Jack's stuff. So how is it that we have both sides of this correspondence? Well, that is the question, isn't it? So uh, Warren did not keep letters. He did not keep Blanche's letters. But Blanche very wisely not only kept every scrap that Warren sent to her, but she also kept what are called carbon copies. And you will have to explain that that for most people. (laughs) Most people were vaguely aware that there's something to do with emails where you do CC and it sends it to somebody else, but they've got no idea what that CC stands for or how it would have even worked in the olden days. Or they could just use their phone and take a picture of it. Exactly. (laughs) (laughs) Well, back in the olden days, people didn't have phones or the the possibility of keeping a, uh, a copy in that way. So Blanche used something called carbon paper, which is a black sheet of paper that has ink on one side. When she would type a letter, she would have two pieces of paper with this black carbon paper sandwich in between. It would go through the typewriter. And then as she typed, it would make a copy as the key strikes would strike the uh, the first piece of paper, it would make a copy on the other side of the carbon paper. And that is where we get the idea of CCing somebody or a letter being CC'd. It stands for carbon copy and it means that a copy has been made. And that's how we happen to have it. Not, not only that, but I think it's really important to emphasize, not only did she keep these things, preserve them and organize them, she made a heroic decision. And that decision was to take these things, to reach out to Marge Mead at the wonderful Wade Center at Wheaton College and ask, would these be of interest? And then deposit those letters in their entirety in this research center. And I cannot tell you how grateful I am, the work that I do, the work that all of us do in Lewis studies for centers like the Wade Center and places where there are archives that are made available to researchers like us so that we can go back to these primary documents and discover the the kind of inside story of the questions that we have about these authors and their work. Yeah, the Wade Center is really sort of the gold standard. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, there you go. 
Uh, that is what a carbon copy is. You're welcome, millennials. <laughs> I want to get to talking about the co- contents of the correspondence, but just a couple more things because people often want to know what what actually does an editor do when they have something like this in terms of taking these letters and turning it into a book? Because you, you do a number of things at both setting up the book afterwards and throughout the book that really help comprehension. Because although we still have both sides of this these correspondence, they're sort of referring to a bunch of stuff that unless you know the people well and the era well, it can still be equally confusing. Yeah, I think it can be very difficult to read somebody else's mail. And so in setting up the book itself, What I tried to do is, first of all, write an introduction that helped readers to be oriented to some of the key themes, some of the key topics, and some of the key discoveries. What is it that we discover from this correspondence that perhaps we haven't known before? Uh, For example, Blanche Biggs wants to know some information about Malcolm, the one that Letters to Malcolm was written to. So she asks, who is this Malcolm that inspired this book? And Warren Lewis says there never was a Malcolm. He is a fictional character entirely, not even based on anyone. And so there's something that we didn't know uh, um, uh, authoritatively. And now we do because she asked that that particular question. But there are references. There are references to historical events. There are references to, for example, some of the shortages and strikes that Warren Lewis is enduring during this particular time. There's discussion of the civil war in Northern Ireland called the Troubles and some of the events that are related to that. And so as I was editing these letters, I wanted to add enough background information through footnotes that when something is being referred to, they had the fundamental information about those historic events. And then, of course, I assumed that readers would be interested, as I was, what happens after the correspondence ends. And so there's also an afterward to the book. So what an editor does is set up the story, give clues about what to pay close attention to, provide just enough background as you're reading along to help in comprehension and understanding, and then to make sure that the story comes to a satisfying completion at the end. And I've also heard you make reference to a stage play. (laughs) Well, as we were saying earlier, I found this story so compelling, I couldn't resist it. So I decided to try my hand at something I hadn't done before, and I adapted the letters to create an abridged version that is a stage play. We've now performed that nine times in different parts of the country from coast to coast, and it's always been extremely well received. And I'm very excited about future groups that might be interested in enacting the stage play. I can also uh, tell you that the audiobook will not be uh, an entire reading of all of the letters, because I think that that would be hard to track with some of the main ideas. Instead, it will be a radio drama of the stage play, and that should be coming out sometime soon. I, I know that Oasis Audio is working on that and hope it will be out sometime here early in the year. That's wonderful. Well, let's get on and talk about the correspondence itself. Uh, And as a framework for working through the contents of these letters, I actually ended up grouping them around the four loves. And so since Storge is about love of the familiar, Dr. King, how is it that Blanche and Warney first enter each other's lives? Warney, after his brother's death, one of the first things he did was decide that he, he thought he wanted to write a biography of his brother, but in the end, um, since he had uh, many of uh, his brother's letters, he decided that he wanted to publish the letters. And so he began on that project. In some ways, it was sort of hit or miss. And eventually, um, he finished the manuscript and it ended up being um, almost like the Lewis papers. That is, there were large quotes from Jack's letters uh, and then a little bit of Warney's uh, connecting of the letters and so forth. When the publisher got it, he really wasn't very happy with it. And so in the end, uh, they had someone ghostwrite Warney's C.S. Lewis letters. 
When Warney saw what had happened to his work, he was not very happy at first. He felt like that the, the ghost writer had, had taken the emphasis of, away from the things that Warney thought ought to be emphasized. So he was, he was pretty unhappy. When the book was published, however, it, it, it created even more interest in Jack. And uh, Warney realized that um, it was a good book. He also got some royalties out of it. That never hurts. <laughs> and um, so that that's how the book was produced. And as Diana has already suggested, um, Blanche read a copy of the book, and that's what prompted her to write Warren. She wanted to know a lot more about him, that is, more about Warney. So her interest in Jack led her to the relationship that he had with, that she had with Warney. So Blanche starts out her letter with a lot of admiration for the editing job that Warren has done, really declares how much C.S. Lewis has helped her. Uh, She says that reading C.S. Lewis has helped Christians specifically to get rid of starry-eyed sentiment and establish their faith in the truth. That's what she admires about C.S. Lewis. What she admires about Warren is just his great skill as an editor, organizing these letters and providing the background that's needed to understand them. Hmm. And so their correspondence continues. Um, And somewhere along the line, they become friends. And in The Four Loves, Jack says the typical expression of opening friendship would be something like, what, you two? I thought I was the only one. So where do you see that transition from a correspondence of pen friends, uh, a simple exchange of information and a thank you letter into the realm of friendship. It's interesting that one of the things that Blanche mentions in her first letters and Warren responds to is this common love of books and of reading. And as you know, when people read the same books, they have uh, an automatic sense of connection. Not only that, but an awful lot to uh, talk about. Later in the letters, Blanche mentions that she's visiting someone who is involved with the mission service that she's in. And the first thing that she does upon entering this new person's house is go directly to the bookshelves and examine the books on the shelf to see (laughs) what kind of person is this really. And we do learn so much, don't we, as we're kind of prowling through one another's bookshelves. And so I think that one thing that really enriches the conversation is them talking about the different books that they're reading, that they like, and the particular things that they discover in those books. What what is it that's attractive about this to you? And, and you'll remember that Lewis's C.S. Lewis's friendship with Arthur Greaves also starts with a book that they both loved and responded to in a very, very strong way. The letters start with this just sort of pen friend sharing of books, sharing of common interests, but also there are a number of topics that both of these mature Christians are very, very concerned about. Uh, Two of them, very briefly, they're very concerned, as I mentioned, about the troubles in Northern Ireland where Jack and Warney grew up. The fighting is uh, outrageous. It's awful. Uh, It's really horrific. And they talk about this and that because of its strong emotional connection, I think, helps draw them closer So that's one aspect, I think, that takes them uh, deeper. The other thing is that Warren at this time is wrestling with some changes in his church. As Don mentioned, he was a warden at his local Anglican uh, congregation. He was very active in church, um, church life in various ways. And during this time, the time of the letters, there's a discussion about the Methodists and the Anglicans joining one another. This is an idea that Warren Lewis is violently opposed to. That's his language. I'm violently opposed to this amalgamation. He thinks that uh, this will ruin or make a mockery of doctrine, right? That's his primary concern. Well, imagine Blanche Biggs. There she is on the mission field trying to do everything that she can in this underdeveloped area to bring, first of all, medical care, but second of all, the truth of the gospel to a place that hasn't heard it before. And so her strategy is very different. The more different Christian groups work together, the better it is in terms of our witness, 
but also in terms of the amount of work that we're able to do in this remote area. So this idea of mere Christianity is one that becomes, I think, very, very important. And uh, their debates about this are remarkable and uh, charitable in a, in a lot of ways, but they come from very, very different points of view about that. I'd just like to add that um, I saw the sort of the point of their relationship moving towards a, a close friendship is when they both asked to be uh, called by their first name. Mm -hmm. She says something like, I'm so glad we're now uh, Warren and Blanche. <laughs> yeah. And that would have been unusual. That would have been quite a step. And that she's yeah. the one who um, initiates that. She's the one who asks if they can use first names. And I do have to say, I love Blanche just throughout this. <laughs> I I think she's actually now my favorite female in the circle that's sort of related to the inkling. She's she's now she's she's past Joy, she's past Dorothy L. Sayers. Blanche, wow. I absolutely love. Just because you met you mentioned these this discussion about church unity and everything. She takes him to pieces beautifully <laughs> i really thought someone living with c.s lewis would be better at this but she does it she does it wonderfully she just takes him apart but she also does it with such grace and gentleness and even at one point we, you mentioned the exchange of of books and and there's there's one point where warney makes a rather rather disparaging comment about tasmania and I've been to Tasmania, and it's beautiful. And this was actually even before I got to the point where Blanche says something that I said out loud while I was there. This is kind of like a mini England. It, the, there are a lot of similarities, not least the weather. rains a lot. Uh, but Warney had made this disparaging comment, and Blanche had actually just sent him a book about Papua New Guinea, where she was a, a missionary so that he could learn about it, because he said he didn't know a whole lot. And she she has a wonderful turn of phrase where she basically tells him, it's like, oh, had I known, I, I would have also sent you a book about Tasmania so we could clear up your ignorance on this subject as well. <laughs> but like I said, she, she, she really takes him to pieces where I think it was just and right. But she does it so gently, so delicately, and, and, and with such charity. Well, the next love then is Eros. And we don't have to spend too much time on this, but... Warren's brother does tell us that when two people who are who discover they are on the same secret road and they're of different sexes, that the friendship which arises between them will very easily pass into erotic love. So Warney and Blanche, did they, as we English people like to say, did they fancy each other? Well, this is this is going to be a topic uh, up for debate. Different readers have different <laughs> takes on it. So all I can give you is my sense of it. I think one sign that this is unusual is this shift from last names to, or formal names to first names and the delight that they have in one another. Another little sign of this is as they're talking about their spiritual life, one of the great gifts of this correspondence is it tells us more about Warren's spiritual life than we've ever known mm. before. What was his spiritual practice? What was his practice for prayer and devotions? And we find out that he gets up at six in the morning to do devotional reading and to say his prayers. And then we find out that Blanche does the same and the warmth that comes through as Warney and Blanche delight that it's both of them getting up at the same time of day, making a cup of tea, sitting down to do their devotional reading and having their prayers. They are half a world away from one another. And yet there is a, I, I, I want to say delight. I don't know another word for it. They're delighted that the other is engaged in the same process at the same time of day in the same kind of daily pattern. Uh, I think we also see a growing warmth and perhaps a leaning into a romantic interest when Blanche begins to talk about her upcoming furlough. And so at the beginning, she just mentions, um, I hear England is very nice in the spring. I have a furlough coming. I could take my furlough in the spring. Then she kind of leaves that and Warren Lewis doesn't get it. <laughs> and then, several letters later, she's a little bit more direct. I'm thinking about making a trip to England. And then he does get it. And his enthusiasm... I, they, they seem a little Twitter-pated, what can I say, as they're making these plans to finally meet. Uh, 
Warren says, and I quote, I hope I live to see you. And there's something there that feels to me very heartfelt. It's not, it'd be nice to meet you. I hope I shall live to see you. And they exchange uh, photographs. And another little indicator that I think that this does move into a, a deep kind of friendship and connection is that Blanche ends up using the picture of Warren Lewis that she receives as a bookmark in her copy of the Book of Common Prayer, which means that on a daily basis, as she's praying, the bookmark marking the day, day after day, is a picture of Warren Lewis. Hmm. That's very interesting. <laughs> I, I'm going to not exactly disagree with Diana, but um, I'll just make a few comments that um, other persons that Warren had correspondence with towards the end of his life or was with uh, other women. And several times he was asked by um, correspondents, why did you never marry? And um, he said, well, the first reason was um, my brother and I, growing up after the death of our mother, we really didn't have a female influence uh, to, to sort of help us know how to deal with um, women. And then he said, as a career army officer, I spent most of my time with the, the only women I would have been able to spend any time with would have been my fellow officers' sisters or the daughters of my commanders. And he said, in either case, um, he didn't think that that would be a very good idea. And then after he got out of the army, he said, I, I wasn't particularly wealthy or wasn't particularly good looking. So I think that this just had never been something that he had uh, aspired to. And then um, towards the end of his life, in one of his diary entries, he says, I am so thankful that I never got married. Now, I think that Diane is exactly right. There was a very deep friendship uh, between the two. Um, but I don't know if Warney would have ever... Maybe he got it for a, sh a brief amount of time, Diana, but I'm not sure he would have ever been able to go the next step. Yeah, I'm personally of the opinion that it probably would have taken an American lady, but uh, an Aussie girl <laughs> might actually have managed it. You know, it, I, I'm, I'm, of the, I'm of the opinion the whole Ruth Pitter thing and with C.S. Lewis could have happened, but she was... She she wasn't aggressive enough like Joy. That's that's what it took to break through the the Lewis boys' tough exterior. Yeah. Maybe she. It, maybe if Blanche had a little more time. I think that next to Warney's mother, the woman that he most loved in in his life was Joy. Hmm. Yeah. I'm telling you, Amer American women, <laughs> as someone that's married to one. And, and, and Diana, when you were describing that interaction, I actually got flashbacks of when Marie and I first started talking, but you get to see the difference because I had given a talk at a church and uh, she had spoken to me afterwards and I went and checked the registration form at the, at the end to find out who, what her last name was so I could go and find her. Uh, and we were chatting on Facebook. And she asked me, you know, where can you get decent English food here in San Diego? And so I thought, uh-huh, here, here's, here's my opportunity just to see if I'm wasting my time here. I said, oh, you know, the place to go is definitely uh, Shakespeare's. And so I wanted to see how she would respond to that. Would she say, oh, perhaps I'll go sometime and then I could ask her out. Uh, but my <laughs> wife, being an American lady, said, oh, great, uh, but I'm only going to go if you take me. Okay. Wow. So, oh, that's good. Oh, that's good. So that's how we started dating. <laughs> yeah, she sounds like she might have a little bit of joy in her. I mm -hmm. yes, yes. This is this this is very very true. Well, we've gone through stalking, we've gone through philia, we've gone through eros. So then we come to charity, and in Jack's radio recording of the Four Loves, he defines agape and charity as God's love for man and Christian love for the brethren. And we've already spoken about that a little bit in terms of the discussions of ecumenism, how Warney was very resistant uh, to the idea of the Methodists and the Anglicans effectively reuniting. Um, so was there anything else that you wanted to say about uh, that particular topic and how it was resolved? Otherwise, I would also love to bandersnatch this pair a little bit, you know, and, and <laughs> what, how did they influence one another? 
Well, two things I would say. One is this idea of how we treat people whose faith journey is different from our own. So Warren's own experience with this is going to be influenced by the violence that he's observing in Northern Ireland and the way that he was raised in a hostile environment between Protestant and uh, and Catholic. And there's, there's an event that happens in the course of these letters that I, I like to call the miracle at the heart of the major and the missionary. And that's a situation where Warren is in hospital with gangrene. He is uh, there for a long time as he's healing. And while he is there, he becomes very, very good friends with the nursing staff, which was his habit. Uh, <laughs> uh, he would, he would uh, be able to get to know them. Um, he would connect a lot with the nurses who were serving in those hospitals. And so one evening he is sitting around in the nursing station with a number of different nurses. And he realizes that this friendly circle uh, is representing people of very, very different spiritual backgrounds, Catholic and Protestant. And he is kind of astonished because these friendship, this friendship that he felt, this connection that he felt with this nursing staff, had it hadn't occurred to him the difference in opinion that was represented by that circle. So as he's sitting and chatting and enjoying the good company of these people who have become friends, he just marvels to himself a, a kind of epiphany, I would guess, uh, I would say, that what really makes the difference isn't the arguments or the debates about philosophical or political or religious issues. What makes the difference is people sitting around, chatting with one another, talking late at night, late into the night about things that matter. And Warren Lewis concludes here, he's in his 70s, remember, and he's been grumbling all along about these difficulties <laughs> in terms of religious difference. And he says with almost a sense of awe that the secret seems to be less debate and more just face-to-face -face time. And he says, if we could just have more time, spending time together, that world history itself would look different. And I think that this is an astonishing moment. And I think that to some extent, the friendship with Blanche sets him up to be open to this in a different way in this season of his life. But perhaps the most profound expression of charity, of Christian love that I see is simply that for Blanche and for Warney, they're each in a situation where they really are not surrounded with peers that they can confide in, people they can tell their secrets to, that they can bear their hearts to, that they can pour out their frustrations to. Blanche is on the mission field. She's an administrator, so she can't talk to the people that she's working with about how irritated and angry and frustrated she is. She has to keep up morale. And Warney, on the other hand, is very concerned about maintaining his brother's legacy. And he doesn't have people around him that he can really be personally honest with about some of his irritations and frustrations. There is a Christian companionship of encouragement that takes place through the course of these letters that I think was a great comfort to both of them in these years of their lives. Uh, I think Diana's uh, exactly right. In Warney's last years, as she suggested, he, the the friends that he had, uh, and there weren't many, either died or or drifted away. So I think he was sort of he sort of felt isolated there at the kilns. He he had the Millers who took care of him, and according to some, took advantage of him. I think that Walter Hooper genuinely loved. Warney and tried to do everything he could to uh, make Warney's life uh, more comfortable. But for uh, whatever reasons, um, I don't think that he could take, he, he obviously couldn't take the place of Jack. And that's what Warney missed. He missed his brother, um, I think, every single day of his life. So for this relationship with Blanche to begin and then blossom, I think as Diana suggested, 
that just met a really significant need in Warney's life. Hmm. Once again, reading this book, Hot on the Heels of Letters to an American Lady, I, I made a couple of connections that I, I don't think I'd have seen otherwise, um, particularly from on that subject of, of ecumenism, because uh, you, you see Lewis's suggestion in very early on, it's in the first few letters, because Mary Willis Shelburne has just converted to Catholicism, and he says, like, you know, I congratulate you, and I'm glad that you're feeling all this spiritual renewal. And he says, but, you know, it's not a step I would take, and eh, we don't need to go into the details of why. Um, and then he says, but by all means, let us keep praying for one another. In fact, I think this is the only work towards unity that yields nothing but good. So he, he has that piece of advice here. And then I read through Major and the Missionary, and then one of the big themes from Blanche is the fact that another thing that we can do to heal the wounds in the body of Christ is to simply spend time with one another. Uh, and I'm going to the uh, C.S. Lewis conference in Oregon uh, next next year at George Fox University. And Dr. Lepoyavi said, do you want to submit a paper? And I said, oh, I've got no idea what I would do. If I would do something, I think it would be on Inkling's advice for ecumenism. <laughs> because uh, I, I, that's, now, that's now the second one that I've seen that I think is really solid advice. And particularly since we see the exchange and you give all of the background so you can see what Warney is having to go through uh, and what it is that manages to change. I'm going to say it, a very stubborn man. <laughs> you see actually what yeah. manages to change his mind is not not necessarily the flawless arguments that Blanche gives him, although I'm sure that uh, softened him up. Um, but it's the, simply the, the, the process of spending time with other Christians of other denominations and other opinions uh, that actually finally gives the room for the Holy Spirit to get some work done. Yeah, I think that's a, a good point. The the wonderful correspondence they have. Um, I, I just got to a point where I felt there was a sort of tenderness. That's the only word I can think of. A sort of tenderness that each had for the other. Dr. Glyde, in your introduction, you wrote that these letters have changed your life. And so I, I want to ask this to Dr. King first and then have you follow up. In what ways do you think that these letters in particular are going to touch the lives of others, whether that is in their perception of warning uh, or their perception of the era or just for their spiritual value and edification? Well, it's, it's an unusual correspondence, as Diana has already suggested, because we have both sides of the correspondence. And I, I think as we read the correspondence, um, we become enmeshed in the story between the two, the narrative that, that we see. And I, I think that in many ways, Blanche sort of draws Warney out. Um, and as you've already noted, she's not um, averse to <laughs> taking issue with, um, maybe, maybe it's his um, lack of wanting to be ecumenical and so forth. <laughs> um, so she does that in a very kind way. And I think Warney does respond. It takes him a while. And I think we get to a point in the correspondence where we see the, her influence on his relating of various kinds of stories. I mean, many of the atrocities that were going on in Northern Ireland, they outraged him. Mm. And uh, he had some uh, very unfavorable thing to say about some of the politicians. Um, but I think that the longer they corresponded, the more she influenced him. And the, the uh, again, I'll go back to that word, the, the, the more tender he gets uh, towards her in particular. I think one of the big contributions of these letters is our perception of Warren Lewis. So when I had a chance to talk with Walter Hooper about this correspondence, he was astonished by it. And his quote was, these letters have the power to rehabilitate our understanding of the major. And I don't think that that's too strong. I think they do rehabilitate it by, as Don said, demonstrating this more spiritual, more tender, more relational aspect of Warren Lewis. And so people who are interested in him and his life, I think this is an incredible window into an aspect of this man that we don't have otherwise. And I think that that is one of the big changes. When I wrote in the introduction that these letters changed my life, I think that the key there for me in terms of big impact was this idea of legacy. What does it mean to leave a legacy? 
Blanche starts her letters by asking, does anything that I've accumulated over a lifetime of work on the mission field, does any of it matter? And I think the fact that people are responding so strongly to this correspondence is a resounding yes. Yes, Blanche, it matters. What you have accomplished matters. What you've devoted your life to matters. And I think that is an invitation for all of us to get thinking. What what will we leave behind? What are the the scraps and the sentences and the aspects of our life that we need to record, that we need to share, that we need to pass along to new generations. I think it invites us to think beyond our lifetime and to wonder how our ideas, our insights, uh, but also our prayers should outlive us. So how are we praying and investing in the future, even in that way? And and that, I think, is one of the great invitations that these letters provide for us. Well, Dr. Goliath, Dr. King, thank you for coming on the show. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. Well, as the landlord rings the bell for final drinks, Dr. Goliath, can you please tell us where people can go to find out more about you and pick up a copy of The Major and the Missionary, The Letters of Warren Hamilton Lewis and Blanche Biggs? Yes, I'd love to. Thank you for that invitation. People can find out more about me and my work at dianaglier.com. My website, there's also a particular page there just about things related to the major and the missionary, including links to some resources that folks might find useful. The book itself is available wherever people love to buy books. It's published by Rabbit Room Press, and that's one of the most fun places to buy it from because Rabbit Room is so clever in making sure that you eagerly anticipate a package coming your way. So I recommend buying it there, but it's available on Amazon and other places that people might enjoy. The audiobook should be out soon. I would be so pleased if people would look that up on Audible as they're thinking about this great story. What a great thing to listen to and just to hear this read by voice actors who enact really the bones of the story in a dramatic way. I think that that'll be a treat. And uh, if people who are listening have the resources, perhaps a local theater group that they're part of, or a large church or community center that's interested in theatrical performances, I would love to be able to help facilitate performances of the play. It's a little less than an hour long. It's very scalable. Uh, and fairly simple to produce. And I'd love to get any inquiries from folks. They can reach me through my website and uh, I can tell you how you could bring the major and the missionary to a location near you. Wonderful. And Dr. King, is there anything you'd like to advertise like soldier, writer, and inkling? Uh, your listeners can find out more about me and the books I've written by going to Montre College. And you can find my um, personal page off of Montre College. Books are available from Amazon. Um, the uh, biography of Warney is also available at Kent State University Press. Wonderful. Well, around the time that this episode is going live, our patron supporters in the upper tiers will be receiving a very special book, which Dr. Glyer had a hand in. You can't get it anywhere else. So if you'd like that, become a patron supporter really soon and you might still get a copy, uh, but I will make sure that she's back on the show, probably for a half pint episode to talk through uh, what this book is, where it came from, and why it is the perfect accompaniment to season seven of Pints with Jack. Uh, but just to close, I know that Lewis said that there are no ordinary people, but one thing I am always surprised by whenever I learn about either another member of the Inklings or of their wider circle, and in that I'm, in, I'm including Blanche, uh, it's that they were all fascinating. Uh, so uh, thank you both for deepening our knowledge of the company that the Inklings kept. And as we wrap up, I would like to thank Dr. Glyer and Dr. King for coming again on the show. And to our sound engineers, Taylor and Sarah, our intern, Julia, to all of our listeners and patron supporters, particularly our top tier supporters. That's Alex, James, Matt, Erica, Joel, Amanda, Thomas, Bud, Shane, Kay, Paul, Gary, Stephen, Kelly, Chris, John, James, Kate, Peter, David, Angela, and Rowdy. And uh, we pray for all of you, uh, particularly every Tuesday and any prayer requests in our Slack channel. And if you've enjoyed this episode, I would just encourage you to maybe write a letter to a friend because it might start a, a, a wonderful friendship or deepen a friendship and uh, 
decades after, after you're gone, you never know, some scholar might come across it and publish it. <laughs> but please join us again next time. When we'll continue going further up. And further in. Cheers. Cheers. Cheers.